Hello? Does this thing work? This is the Peak Boredom Podcast. Three, two, one. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Peak Boredom Podcast. Today we have a special guest. We have Mirabel. Hi! Hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thanks for so, having me. <laughs> Mirabel is a music composer and she's also a performer. Um, she plays the flute really well and you should go check out some of her compositions because they're really nice. Also her Thanks. Twitch. Um, congrats reaching 1,000 followers. Hey, yeah, thank you. Yes, hello. <laughs> right there. before the new year. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to also introduce yourself a bit more? Sure. Um, my name's Mirabel, and I, well, yes, I'm a musician. I play the flute, piano, guitar, the Chinese zither, um, the guzhen, and I compose, and I also sing and songwrite. Um, but yeah, on Twitch, I do kind of all of that. Um, I sing some covers and originals on Twitch, and then we also make live compositions. So it's done in real time, and then I post it on my socials after. That's a good time. <laughs> but yeah, that's basically me. Yeah, so check that out if you want to see what like a live music composition is like. So Mirabel, how did you get into music? Because that's a lot of instruments. <laughs> That is a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, I got into music, I'd say, because my mom is a musician. So I was kind of just born into it, I guess. <laughs> um, my mom is, she plays the guzhen, the Chinese zither. So when she's in Taiwan, she was part of this national orchestra. And then when my family immigrated to Canada and then had me, like, it was just, I would hear guzhen all the time and I would be like, crawling under the instrument because it's a it's a big instrument it's like it's long and it's kind of like table desk sort of thing it's like stood on legs so I would just be crawling under there so I guess like I would be hearing music all the time and so I started on piano and guzheng because my mom taught us um us because my brother and I um and then and then I got into guitar I wanted to sing songwrite I wanted to be like Avril Lavigne, I think. <laughs> She's like the first inspiration. Um, so I taught myself guitar and then my brother, because my brother did some instruments as well. I think he, he like dabbled in cello or something, but he also started on piano and then, and then he played flute in like junior high, high school. And then he he stopped that. <laughs> um, so then I took it on because um, we already have a flute. So then I started learning flute, and um, and then that was like throughout my high school years. And then in university, I was like, I wanted to do. Well, I'm interested in architecture and design and all that stuff. Um, but then I realized I was really bad at math. So <laughs> probably yeah. so bad at math. <laughs> Yeah, so I like decided that probably wasn't a good idea, um, and flute was there. Like, I did band in high school, and that was just the most fun that I've had. Like, that was the best class. So, so I auditioned, and um, I went to UC for my undergrad, and then apparently I decided I wanted to keep doing that. So now I'm doing my master's in uh, at the University of Toronto for flute. Yeah, wow. That's, that's how. <laughs> yeah. Before we go into that music master stuff, um, I'm wondering because I've accidentally done this as well. Your so your family plays a lot of the guzheng, right? Have you ever fiddled around with the tuning and then messed it up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Well, like I've like tried because. The strings are like on little bridges, right? There are little pegs. And I remember being really little and like trying to move those around and it would just fall over and I thought I broke it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Cause like the tension on the string is kind of like, the tension is strong. So like, it's hard to put it back. And I was like, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> but it was okay. But I haven't really like, really properly tuned it off just for fun or anything but i've done that <laughs> yeah 
I feel like I've done that and I don't know if it's in tune because like I would um, be told to bring it in for performance in school and by the time it gets there obviously you have to tune it like you know with any other string instrument every time you play you have to tune it right like cellos and violins and I never tune it I only tune it whenever I go to go to some class and that's oh my not me that's my teacher <laughs> I mean if it sounds right I don't know if it sounds right, Mars. What's the problem? You just have to pretend it sounds right. And go with the flow. Yeah. Fake it till you make mm-hmm. it. This is yeah. <laughs> well, Great. you're not like you're not playing with an orchestra or anything. You're playing by yourself. It's fine. I don't know <laughs> anyone else in the grade that plays it, so I guess yeah. I think they just went along with it. Like yeah, it sounds cool. I'm like yes. <laughs> It probably was terrible, but <laughs> yeah, who knows? So, I'm curious. What exactly happens in a music masters? <laughs> um, so in music school, I guess there are like different paths you can take. Um, you can go into performance, composition, education are the main three. Um, at U of T, there's also a music technology program. Um, what? What is that? <laughs> it's basically, um, well, I don't want to like say false, fake news, but like <laughs> recording. <laughs> I think you learn a lot about recording and like uh-huh. acoustic, electroacoustic sounds, um, producing a little bit, maybe. Um, oh, so it's not like EDM master's degree. No, <laughs> not <laughs> quite. <laughs> but you do learn like. You know, technology, um, all the things that have to go into, have to do with like recording and creating stuff. Um, <laughs> there are also like um, master's programs where in history, um, so you study music history, musicology is what it is. Um, there's also theory if you want to get into that more. <laughs> I'm really not a theory person, so I can't relate. <laughs> um, but and like ethnomusicology, where you learn about um, research about like music in different areas of the world. Um, but yeah, so I'm doing a performance degree, um, and basically, my, so my thesis is to do a recital to perform at the end of my semester um, each year. Unfortunately, COVID canceled my first one, <laughs> and this year I have to send in a recording. So, for my whole degree, I don't get to perform live, which is kind of sad, but it's okay. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so your classes are you basically you have lessons, which are like your one on one weekly lessons with your professor, who are usually like they're really great people <laughs> they're like usually teachers are um they play in like the orchestra like the tso the toronto symphony orchestra or another professional orchestra or maybe they're soloists and so you get that one-on-one and then you also have to take some like history classes some theory um and ensembles so kind of like high school band but but better <laughs> intense <laughs> Um, yeah, that's basically, that's pretty much what that is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Now, I know a lot of um, Asians, no matter where they are, basically, they all pretty much know how to play one instrument. It's like mandated by their parents. So when people say, I can play piano, um, <laughs> that does not mean they can actually play the piano. <laughs> I but- can play one song in the piano. <laughs> Hot <laughs> I don't even know the name, but yeah, every Asian kid probably learned probably mostly the piano. Yeah. yeah the violin. But like they never allow their children to actually pursue a music degree because they perceive it as like a, wa- a job that doesn't really have many job prospects. So why is it considered like difficult to maybe work in classical music? Because I would say it, for like on the base level it takes a lot of focus practice determination um (laughs) which i guess like applies to any job or like anything you want to be good at um but 
Um, I guess like the main sort of outlet for or job as a musician that you would think of <clears throat> is like orchestra, like to be to yeah. play in an orchestra, right? And these orchestras, auditions are hard to come by. Um, each orchestra kind of, like especially as a wind player, I think there are less wind players in an orchestra. So like flutes, you would only have like two parts, like flute one, two, and like a piccolo player. Um, so like three spots, I guess. And, but people who are in an orchestra kind of just stay there for forever <laughs> until they retire. <laughs> so um, they don't open up audition spots don't open up very often and like there are so many people who go through music training there's so many talented musicians out there um and everybody's competing for like these maybe this one spot <laughs> like one spot might open up and like there are maybe like 500 people who want to audition for that spot um so it's a rigorous process um but but people do it, it happens, it works. <laughs> um, it's just, yeah, I think it's just like the amount of available available jobs, I guess, versus the amount of people who are competing for that job. And also like to make it as a soloist, um, like you don't really hear about too many of them, I guess, like you wouldn't really know. They're not pop singers. <laughs> it's not a very popular, genre i guess um but yeah <laughs> sort of like that this one's super random but on the topic of like flute soloist um you know the mozart magic flute yeah what is it about because i've only seen maybe like the what was it called the queen of the night and it confused me even more uh, really <laughs> I don't... <Wait>, why <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was supposed to be about a flute, but that entire song had no actual flute in the performance part. Yeah. Also, fun fact, apparently Mozart didn't like the flute. What? <laughs> I thought he um, played the piano. Yeah, he is a pianist, uh, composer. But yeah, he didn't... I don't think he liked flute. There's only one flute concerto. Um, Mozart flute concerto in G major is like the one that everybody knows and plays like when you're a musician when you're a music student you basically have to learn a mozart concerto um because there's one for every instrument basically there's one for clarinet and there's oh. one for oboe and so technically there are two for flute um g major and d major but we just stole the d major one from the oboist <laughs> so <laughs> um yeah <laughs> The Magic Flute, though, I don't actually, I haven't actually seen the Magic Flute. I think we studied it a little bit, <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, he doesn't really like flute. <laughs> <laughs> then why did he write a whole thing called the Magic Flute? It's <laughs> a great question. <laughs> you like he did it out of spite. <laughs> did a lot of things out of spite. Like it sounds like something he would do. Mozart was very um, Weird. childish. Oh yeah, that's true. I recall, like, this could be completely wrong, but I think somebody mentioned how his wife or somebody really loved the flute, so so he kind of had to make some flute stuff. This could be totally wrong, <laughs> but for some reason that's what I remember. <laughs> Wow, Mozart, tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <sighs> but what about performance anxiety? Because I hear that's very common amongst performance <laughs> musicians. Um, do you get yeah. it? And how do you deal with it? Always. Every single time I have to perform. <laughs> um, and it kind of sucks. It's. I don't think um, it's as like severe... I don't think my anxiety is as severe as some other people that I know is, but yeah, it really it sucks because you want to perform, but then it, <laughs> like how can you do that when you're scared of performing at the same time? I think what helps is just to 
I mean, to start to like understand that feeling, to feel it, and to get used to it. <laughs> and then so you acknowledge it and that it's there. Um, like you don't have to fight it or anything, just know what this feeling feels like and then do your thing. But if you're trying to fight it, then I think that just makes it worse. It just makes everything mm -hmm. so much more frustrating and so much more difficult yeah. to deal with. So acknowledging that it's there and just getting used to it, I guess, making friends with this horrible feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get it every single time I have to perform though. So it has gotten easier, I think, but it's still there. <laughs> Do you get affected by the temperature of the room? Cause I know it sounds really random, but I've performed piano before and I've practiced and everything sounds fine. And then, oh, this is the bad part. I, it happened during an ABRSM exam. Um, oh, no. I walked into the room and because the examiner was, I don't know, he felt like Indonesia was too hot. The AC was on blast and mm -hmm. my fingers just froze up because it's like it got stiff because of the temperature and I did not do well. Oh no, he was sabotaging. You guys. <laughs> I don't want to see kids. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, that, that was something my sister mentioned that like every music teacher's room is freezing cold and none of them seem to realize it. That is true. Is true. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like true for me because in UC, our music building, um, I think like where the music stuff was happening, that's kind of where the what do you call it? Like the boiler room was? So so the temperature was varying a lot. <laughs> um, so like, usually it's like freezing in there and we couldn't do anything about it. So we would just, my teacher would have like her winter jacket on <laughs> and stuff. What? <laughs> That's yeah. just intense. But then like in summers or something, like it, it would flip. It would get, it's either extremely hot or extremely cold. There's no no in between <laughs> but but yeah that does affect me as well because yeah when like the fingers thing like you can't move your fingers when you're cold <laughs> that's one thing for sure um but the other thing is especially when you have to play with piano like um our instruments like when it's cold it's you're flat and when it's really warm you go kind of sharp so mm -hmm. it's really hard to adjust to tuning if you're playing with a pianist in a really cold room. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it struggles. <laughs> <laughs> the things people don't know about when you play music. So let's yeah. move on to a to something that you're really amazing at. Composition. So <laughs> you look like you don't believe us. <laughs> no, like I actually like one of I think they produced one for a foundation. That one's like all your composition sounds very, very smooth and nice <laughs> amongst my <laughs> stress of whatever my master's is right now. <laughs> we could go on to like, how have you um, started in like playing around with composition? Because I know as someone who only plays the piano in one song, <laughs> I played <laughs> around with it and it in probably grade eight well, grade eight, um, and it was really, really fun. But how did you get into it more? But before we get into that, like we should probably clarify. Um, oh, yeah, she sure. composes background music for video games and film, right? Yeah, yeah. I've done a few. I'm working on uh, two video game projects right now, and <laughs> yeah, last year I did a little short animation film. It's really fun. So when you create songs, not necessarily like the video game and film scores, um, which ones come first? Do you have the melody first or do you have like the lyrics written down first? Ooh, songs? Like yeah. Singing songs. <laughs> um, I think uh, melody comes first for sure. Um, lyrics kind of are secondary because I would usually... What I do is like play around on my guitar or piano, whatever instrument, and I like what I'm playing. <laughs> and then <laughs> I start like I start saying 
gibberish, not like it doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense. I'm just like humming and being like la la la, <laughs> and then <laughs> slowly like I'll throw in a random word and then it'll start forming into something. And typically, like I guess most of my songs have been based around like. Thoughts that I can't really get rid of. It's kind of like journaling for me, where I'm kind of just word word vomiting, <laughs> but <laughs> musically, I guess. <laughs> um, and then, but yeah, that's that's kind of how that works for me. So I guess melody, yeah, instruments, sounds first, and then lyrics. <laughs> yeah. Most people write their thoughts on journals. Mirabelle decides to write whole songs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I also write in journals, but yes, Great. it's kind of it's really it's both therapeutic. <laughs> it's both, yeah, it's both guys. So, where do you get your inspiration from, generally? Um, by the thoughts that I can't get out of my head, <laughs> but also I guess like other musicians um, are always inspiring um like Kina Grannis <laughs> Mars knows Kina Grannis um and I guess yeah, she I don't be, know like, her but she's cool yeah <laughs> imagine if you just imagine you were best friends and it's like what <laughs> if you're wondering you. who she is she's the girl who is I guess and in- in the crazy rich asian scene where they were getting married she was the vocalist and uh what she, what's the name of the song she was singing the, the elvis Presley song not yeah, the weird half mandarin no, song. no 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 the wedding the 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 the, 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 yeah. the walking on <laughs> yeah can't, can't help can't. falling in love yeah but she has like a beautiful yeah. rendition where it's like slow with the guitar and yeah she's pretty yeah. cool there's some strings it's beautiful. Oh um, yeah, there's a l- three little girls, right? That is so accurate, though. Yeah. Like being told to perform in your relative's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. You have? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't look at like, me like that. I was told piano? to. Hmm? What? <laughs> Did you perform piano? Piano I or performed... something else? Yeah. I performed the uh, Pier Jin and also oh, yeah. I had to sing Love is Patient, Love is Kind, which was like a, you know, that church song. Yeah, I had to perform <laughs> that in the same wedding, by the way. <laughs> I was told to perform twice in one wedding. Oh man. <laughs> Busy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I was one of those girls that, you know, the flower girls that threw. I was busy that wedding. You I don't. Doing- Everything. You just did everything, huh? Yeah. You didn't get to enjoy the festivities or anything. You're just working for your relative. <laughs> That's true. How dare they? Man, I did not realize that looking back now. You're the you're the thing that you're the main gear that made everything run smoothly. Yeah, I guess. Now so when you do like music composition stuff, do you do commissions? Yeah, um, I have done a few, like, people ask for, like, for example, like a podcast. They want music for podcast intros, um, stuff like that, or like YouTube intros. Um, but yeah, I've done a few of those. And, like, background music for a product video for some companies, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this is probably a good time for us to explore what to do and what not to do when you commission someone. Because I've definitely seen people who treat music and art as, you know, a free service, which it's not. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. so I don't Um, know what your experiences with that are. Yeah, some people don't really think music is like... um, like it's just like any other profession, any other career. Like you have to work for it. You have to. There's so many hours of practicing that goes into um, music, and just yeah, all the years of hard work and dedication that you don't get to see. So people think that they're paying maybe like 
maybe it's for a wedding gig or something and they think um, they want to pay you a certain amount, but it's like not enough <laughs> um, because they think that they're just paying you for the hour that you're there for or whatever. But there's actually like years and years of experience that led us up to this point to be able to just show up and play music for you. Um, yeah, so I guess there's some misconception in that where people think like this is we're just paying you for the product, but you're actually you're paying for the years of hard work, I guess. Um, yeah, I think that happens in like film and photography as well a little bit. Yeah, yeah. People think, yeah, like they just want the one photo, but there's actually a lot of so much work that goes behind that. Yeah. If anything, like these kind of professions, people are actually underpaid. Like when they set a commission price, it's usually way below what they should be paid. And people still ask for like discounts and like, can you do it for free? Can you send me a sample? Yeah. So, yeah. Even though yeah, that like, some like, people are like, yeah. oh, what did you say, Mark? Some people are like, send, send me a sample and it's like, <laughs> They have their portfolio portfolio up there, <laughs> and they're like, "Please send me a sample for free." Like, don't do that. No, so they can just take it away from you, right? Oh, it's just the <laughs> amount. Like, if you want to, for example, your commission for a podcast, and then they probably send you some kind of I don't know, like ideas what it could be, and then. It just doesn't come out like you don't just go to the computer or like your instruments and then it comes up. <laughs> it takes like a lot of work. Uh, how do you usually approach that when it comes to like when they give you an idea? Um, I kind of give like a time frame to give myself some buffer time because like you're saying it doesn't come immediately like sometimes <laughs> if only right yeah <laughs> um but sometimes like an idea they have maybe like a big idea of what they want it to sound like mm -hmm. what genre sort of thing um and i could either come up with it in like 20 minutes because i'm really inspired mm -hmm. or it could come in like three days because i've got nothing <laughs> um so there's usually like a little bit of a buffer time um, mm -hmm. of like I can get it to you in like a week or something like that maybe yeah yeah and people will need to remember to credit the artist as well don't just take random samples off the internet and think it's okay unless it's creative yeah, comments that'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the other also. thing is like um, mm. yeah um, like I have a lot of friends who are in this creative field, creative profession, and like, it's, sometimes we like exchange work, like I do this thing for you and you do this thing for me, which is great. Um, and also I have some supportive friends who will pay me for like my music things or photography. Like if this is, cause I've set it out as like, this is kind of like, this is my career. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. they're, down to like to help out in that way i guess to support each other in that way so yeah yeah because this is definitely it goes across like photography music um art people don't properly credit and that's someone's career essentially so when you do want to like borrow maybe even for inspiration credit the artist because one of the worst cases i think i've seen was someone was tracing over someone else's work and once the original artist realized that they contacted the person saying hey it's not cool that you're tracing over my work and you don't really acknowledge it and the person played victim and her fans basically chased after the original artist and the original artist had to quit instagram so <laughs> yeah really there's a lot of stories like this yeah. oh my goodness or like people's like stealing mixing of a song so they would like yeah 
because the way a song is arranged can also bring different like moods and stuff right so i've heard a lot of times where the mixing is stolen <laughs> not necessarily the song just like how to mix and it's also very disrespectful of the mixing the original you know the one did the cover do and that creates an entire culture around it that's not really good for musicians and artists as well because a lot of musicians and artists they have this entire time when people make them feel as though their work needs to be free for a certain time when they start off and that's they're working for that that's their entire career so and i think that some people have a hard time putting a price to their work because they're so used to being demanded for free content mm -hmm. yeah and like cuz there's just no set price for this sort of stuff like everybody is everybody's work is different so you can't yeah there's just no like there's no set price it's a little bit confusing sometimes but yeah i was going to ask a question to mm -hmm. you guys and i forgot what it was <laughs> You take your time. Um, it, what are your thoughts of like um, working for free, or do you think when you're starting out with something like maybe it's photography, or you're making videos for somebody, do you think you should start out working for free, or do you think you need to set a price and get paid right off the bat? Hmm. This is hard. One. That, that's a really tricky question. <laughs> yeah. Because most people do start I out think it... for free, right? But yeah. Yeah. Like when I started. But then some people. No, you go first. Some people are like never work for free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. They're like don't ever work for free because then that diminishes your value. But I don't know. Hmm. I've heard um, thoughts about that from Simply Neological, the YouTuber, because she used to do um, she used to do her own free pictures, right, of like the nail polish, showing off the nail polish, and then afterwards she started um, asking companies to pay her because they were using her pictures for promotional use, and that's how she decided um, to start charging prices. But that is a good question, <laughs> just because of how the industry is built. In my opinion, I think um, it should be a gradual increase. So maybe when you start out, you have like really low prices, and then eventually you work it all the way up. So not not necessarily doing it for free, but also not necessarily like um, I don't know charging prices. I don't know. Pricing is really difficult for these kind of things. Yeah. There's also like this thing of like. Like, maybe it's for the experience, you know, like maybe, I mean, I guess it really depends on what your, what the job is, but like, some things I guess would, could be worth it if to do for free, if you're gaining a lot of experience that you think will help in the long run in this career, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's for, for something that's small or like an organization or something you're actually like willing to do for free then no doubt that is okay um, when but when it's like you're asking a friend and they're they want you to be compensated or you're you're doing this work because you have to then that's when it needs to be charged because it's kind of hard to like in in school you learn that you just do stuff but you never learn how to like i don't know what's the value of me cutting clips and putting it together <laughs> uh, it can seem easy but then not a lot of people even know how to do that yeah. i think at the end of it just um if someone um charges you a certain price a commission fee then don't argue with it i think that's the end of it but i'm curious when did you decide that like what like, what was your journey to figuring out that, oh, I need to charge people for composition? Um, I guess 
when more people started asking me for it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I got to a point where I like realized I've been doing it for some time and that, you know, I actually, I think my, I've been getting like a lot of positive feedback and I'm like, okay, so this is actually good. Nice, good to know. <laughs> um, and that, yeah, <laughs> it's like something that I can actually do. Um, and I feel pretty confident in doing it. And I guess that's when I decided that maybe, you know, to start doing that. That's great. <laughs> that's a good, um, yeah, when people ask you too much, maybe we should pay me. <laughs> yeah. It's a good uh, <laughs> what are your favorite movies, tracks, and all that? Since we haven't touched like your music taste, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say what I said last time. I guess Little Woman, because that's the most recent film I think that I watched <laughs> um, that I was really into. Um, so I think that score was by Alexandre Desplat. Um, one from Harry Potter? Yeah. What? I think he did some Harry Potter. He did some, yeah, not all. He also did... <laughs> I think he did... Um, what was that called? The Budapest Hotel, I think. Oh! Um, um, the Wes Anderson movie? Mm-hmm. Oh, that yeah. was him? Oh, interesting. Is it De Plow or Des? <laughs> French. <laughs> don't know. Um, I, I'll put his name here. <laughs> you guys live in Canada. Does he? Ow. Uh, <laughs> no, Canada is well, like he's second French. language French, right? Oh, like, only Quebec. I'm thinking it's supposed to be Desplat. Desplat? De Desplat? Wait, I'm googling it. I'm Desplat. Just... <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> We're just butchering his name now. Oh, he saying. is from France. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, then it might be Diplo. Yeah. Diplo? Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm so Diplo. Probably. I don't, oh, I don't. yeah. You know those things in like in like Wikipedia? It's like, how do you say it? Those like weird letters. It says, it says, yeah, Diplo. Diplo. Nice. I'm sorry, famous man. I know French. <laughs> sorry, he also please. did um, the imitation game. <laughs> Oh, that was that one was really good too. A lot of like classical, um, a lot of piano though. If I, oh, yeah. I don't remember correctly. Is it truly a piano? Oh well, that I don't know. <laughs> you know those songs that like confuse you. Um, we were talking about this with someone else about how one of our friends was listening to Joe Hisashi's Bygone Days, the one from. Pokoroso, I think. And he thought that the song was performed by a saxophone and it turned out to be a trombone. And he was like, I did not know trombones made that sound. Oh, oh no. <laughs> I also had that thought with, um, um, this is embarrassing, Asian Dreams by Joe Hisashi. Joe Hisashi, maybe there's a trend here. Um, he, Asian Dream, I thought, had multiple string instruments in them just because of like there's high notes and low notes and it turned out to just be nine cellos nine oh. cellos wait i want to listen to this i don't know what i don't know what this sounds like i don't either <laughs> like, which movie was this in can i like yeah, yeah. Can I google it real yeah. quick yeah go ahead <laughs> it was in um i i heard it during the 2017 world figure skating competition what <laughs> What was it um, called again? Asian Dream by Joe Hisashi. It was performed under, it was remixed, remixed, under the name Hope and Legacy, the performance by Yuzuru Hanyu. And when I heard it, I was like, this is a great song and it must have certain instruments in it. Nope, it was just nine cellos. <laughs> um, in this video, there's piano. What? Oh yeah, he conducted um, he conducted the orchestra with the piano as well. Orchestra yeah, I, nine cellos. I'll put a link. Yeah, it sounds like. 
Yeah, cellos are very versatile. <laughs> yeah, if only they weren't so big. But they sound great. <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish I could play cello. I wish I owned one. That, that's it. <laughs> Not even to play, just own. <laughs> um, I well, in order to play it, I have to own one. <laughs> I true. I learned a little bit of it during the beginning of the pandemic, but since I moved city and now live in an apartment complex, I don't think I can play it around here. But maybe one day. So we'll just end it on that note. I wish I had a cello. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mirabel, for coming on. It's been yeah. fun. Um, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Yes. Don't forget to follow her and we'll see you soon. Commission her. Bye. <laughs> yes, only commission. <laughs> Thanks for having me. No problem. Hello. Hi. Thank you for listening to the Peak Boredom Podcast. This is Mars and Inga signing off. And don't forget to tune in next week. Please. Bye.